I'm going to try to be somewhat practical here. Um, you've heard a lot of data, and uh, the last two talks were very supportive of, I think, why we should be talking about statin intolerance. Okay. So why statin intolerance? Well, we have a problem, and I'm going to try to tell you why it's important to be dealing with it. So first of all, you've heard a lot of data about the cardiovascular benefits of having patients on statins and reducing, ultimately, cardiovascular risk. Um, both of the speakers before gave you that information, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. The one thing Dr. Rocco mentioned briefly, though, is it's not just the LDL lowering that we think we get from statins. There's also what we call pleiotropic or secondary benefits that may occur. This slide kind of tries to suggest a bunch of them. And so the LDL lowering may not be the only focus that we should be on. We potentially should be getting our patients on statins because there may be other benefits that help lower that CV risk um, as well. So the second part of the problem is we've got lots of patients on statins. And we see a lot of patients then come in and complain about the problems with the statins. So why do we see so many patients come in complaining of problems with their statins? Well, first of all, the biggest class of drugs that's prescribed out there is these um, anti-hyperlipidemic drugs. Now, that's the whole class. That's everything that's been talked about, the niacin, the fibrates, as well as the statins, cholestyramine. But when you look at this, about 85% of the hyperlipidemic uh, agents out there that are prescribed are statins. When you look at the actual prescriptions, there's over 250 million prescriptions written for statin medications each year just in the United States. So you're talking about lots of prescriptions being written. And it also ends up that about 12.5%, almost 13% of the adult population is on a statin medication. So that's a lot of people we are treating with statins, and we are going to see patients come in complaining of them. And we all know that we want those patients on the medication because it's going to be beneficial. Now, I'm going to take some uh, liberty here and actually uh, dispute what Dr. Rocco said about side effects. The information he showed you, and I'll show you some as well, is all from clinical trial data. And clinical trial data, you have to remember, is actually somewhat biased in the sense that a lot of the trials will have run-ins, so the patient has to tolerate the medication. So you're already eliminating those patients that are um, going to be problematic. Um, second of all, we see in practice a lot more than has been reported in the clinical trial uh, literature. And again, you know, you all uh, hear about this data constantly. So I'm going to really talk about primarily muscle problems um, and how to get around those because that's mostly what we hear. But as Dr. Dr. Rocco already alluded to, I mean, there are other factors that are problematic with statins and can uh, cause patients to be, quote unquote, statin intolerance. So let's focus on the two main ones, muscle and liver. But before I go on to liver, Dr. Rocco mentioned GI side effects and others, such as memory loss and you know, some of the other problems that are out there. Now, when you really look at some observational data that's been placed out there, side effect problems with statin medications or you know, patients coming in and saying they can't tolerate the statin medication is actually somewhere probably higher than the clinical data, and it's actually probably somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of patients. So if you look at that, I mean, we've got lots of patients out there, over 250 million prescriptions. That's going to be a lot of patients that are coming in and complaining about it. To make matters worse, as we all know, um, every time there's a 
There used to be a Lipitor commercial, and now there's a Crestor commercial out there. You hear all the side effects. They have to list them all. And of course, one of the big side effects is, you know, they have muscle aches and pains or uh, factors like that. So of course, the patient saw the commercial. They've been feeling achy. They come in and uh, want to talk to you about the problem that they're having with their statin medication because they know it's coming from their atorvastatin or their simvastatin. Now, liver, uh, again, as Dr. Rocco showed you, doesn't occur that often, but again, it's a reason that patients get stopped uh, from their statin medication because they have elevations in their LFTs. Now, this is just some data just to make the point that, in fact, there may be some dose-related uh, effects of uh, the medications on the likelihood of having LFT elevations in there. But the one thing that is nice is that it really doesn't occur that much, like Dr. Rocco said. And in fact, even if it does occur, we know that if we stop the statin, it usually resolves and there are no problems. And there's never been a reported case where a patient has had true liver failure from just a statin medication. There are case reports of patients having liver failure when statins have been used in combination with other medications that are problematic to the liver, but nothing from just a statin by itself. So to get LFT elevations out of the way, I think one of the problems that people often see is that they'll put a patient on a statin and um, get LFT later on, and the LFT will be elevated a little bit. But again, one of the things you have to go back and look at is what's the patient's baseline been like? You know, have they always had a mild elevation or have they in the past, even before you put them on the statin, had situations where they've had um, elevated LFTs? We know that there are a lot of patients with high cholesterols who have fatty livers, which can give you an elevated LFT. And in fact, Often their elevated liver or their um, fatty livers and elevated LFTs are because of elevated cholesterol. And if you start treating with a statin, their LFTs don't get worse and may actually in time get better. So again, you need to know where you're starting from. Don't just stop them because they go up a little. The actual recommendations is that you've got to get three times the upper limit of normal before you really should be concerned. So again, you know, be practical about what you're doing because, as I said, there's not really long-term problems with a mild elevation in LFTs in these patients, especially if there's some underlying fatty liver, and they're not going to go on to acute hepatic failure. Look at secondary factors. Sometimes people's LFTs go up because they just went on a drinking binge uh, the weekend before they were in Las Vegas before they came in and got their labs done or somebody put them on an antibiotic that may affect their um, LFTs as well because of the interaction with the statin. So be a little bit of a detective when you see elevated LFTs and just don't stop them because of, we know that there's so much cardiovascular benefit. Okay, let's go to muscle because muscle is the biggest thing that everybody sees and the problem and the reason that most of us end up stopping our statin medications. Now, what are we talking about with muscle effects? Well, there's myopathy, which is you know muscle, uh, at least minor muscle damage. Is it myalgia, is it myositis? Or is it truly a major muscle problem where you have rhabdomyolysis? So the problem is that the definitions here are all over the place. The only one that we truly have a good definition for is rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is where you have um, a elevation in your creatinine kinase to 10 times upper limit of normal with a change in your creatinine and you're having acute uh, renal failure and you also often in that case you know will start having discolored urine, all the signs of rhabdomyolysis. As Dr. Rocco mentioned, Rhabdomyolysis is very uncommon 
with statin medications. Usually if you have rhabdomyolysis, it's because of some, again, some other additional factor. The patient got pre present or placed on a antibiotic or some other medication that increased their uh, statin level. They did something crazy like uh, went out and ran a marathon and didn't hydrate themselves real well. You know, they did something that uh, precipitated that problem. The exception to that is that, in fact, most of you or a lot of you will remember that there was Baycol or Cerevastatin, one of the statins, that got pulled from the market because it did cause rhabdomyolysis. Also, you know that uh, within the last five years, Simvastatin had a change in its label because of problems with potential rhabdomyolysis, and a dose of over 80, or a dose of over 40, was kind of uh, discouraged uh, to be used with simvastatin. But then when you look at the rest of the statins in um, concert, there's really not much of a problem with rhabdomyolysis. It's the above one that we see mostly, and really is myalgias just muscle pain? Is myositis, you have to have elevated CKs? If you look out there, there's no true definition, and even if you look at associations like the National Lipid Association or um, other organizations, they really don't have a consistent um, definition. But we do see a lot of problems with these um, issues. Now, Dr. Rocco showed you similar data, and I think part of the problem we've always had is that for a long time, the uh, pharmaceutical companies were telling us, based on their clinical trial data, which is what Dr. Rocco shared as well, that these things didn't occur but we know that our patients walk in and tell us their muscle aches. And it's much higher than um, this data. There's been, again, as I said, some observational data that, will show you, that shows that patients complaining of muscle aches on statins is probably somewhere closer to maybe 10 to 12 percent, not these um, lower numbers. Now, again, the problem that we have is that truly myositis or myalgias or whatever from the uh, statins, because most of us know that a lot of our patients have muscle aches and pains, whether they're on statins or not, and then they get put on a statin, and as I already said, they see the TV commercial, and now all of a sudden those muscle aches and pains are from the statin. Um, and again, that's something I'll get back to. So there's been all these theories about why do people get muscle pains when they put on, are put on statins. And as we all know, the statins block HMG-CoA reductase, and that is a early step in subsequent uh, production of all these different compounds, a lot of which are involved in muscle and muscle metabolism. And the thought has been, well, we're disrupting all of this, and that's why all of a sudden we're getting muscle problems. Well, it's interesting because, again, uh, there's been a lot of focus on coenzyme Q10, and a lot of the data with um, coenzyme Q10 and its relationship to the development of myalgia has not been as strong um, as people would like. Sorry. So again, people think that, well, we get muscle aches and pains, we should check a creatinine kinase. The problem with that is that most of these patients don't have elevated creatinine kinases. And it's gotten to the point where we're not even uh, suggesting that people get baseline uh, CKs on patients before they start them on statins. That used to be a recommendation a long time ago, but that's kind of fallen out of favor because they get the symptoms and they don't have any changes. Now, again, a lot of the definitions of true muscle problems is related to having a CK of greater than three times the upper limit normal. But the problem is patients will come in with, again, muscle aches and pains, and somebody will draw a CK on them, it's elevated, and they stop it. And it goes back to the fact that do we have any baseline data on the patient? There are patients who run a elevated CK as their norm, and again, that becomes the controversy of, is it worth having a baseline or not? So sometimes you need to go back and look at, do you have any previous CK data on the patient when they're not on a statin? 
or if you're going to stop the statin, you know, repeat it. It may remain elevated, um, and there's you know a high propensity to have elevated CKs in some subpopulations. African Americans are more likely to have slightly elevated CKs. People with chronic renal failure or any type of CKD. Um, but again, if you do find an elevated CK, look for secondary factors as well. So look in has the patient been put on a medication, as we talked about, that can raise the um, LFTs, can also sometimes cause a CK bump because, again, it, when you put on a lot of these medications, what they're doing is actually raising the uh, level of the statin within your body or within the bloodstream. Okay. So I'm going to talk a couple, uh, give some data on some of the, the different concepts that are out there that may be related to this whole myalgia issue. Now, one is coenzyme Q10. Everybody talks about putting patients on coenzyme Q10 because it should help. And if you go and do any internet search, which your patients do, they all want to be on coenzyme Q10 um, because they know it should help their uh, underlying problems with their statin medications. There's lots of studies out there. I picked the most recent ones just to, or this most recent one just to look at. And the data on coenzyme Q10, again, is conflicting because it's very hard to figure out whether people's coenzyme Q10 levels are okay. The levels in the muscle, the level in the blood may not be consistent. This trial was very interesting where they took patients who had had um, problems with statin intolerance due to myalgias. They put them on coenzyme Q10. They put them on a dose of um, 100 milligrams uh, a day. And then they looked at uh, a visual analog scale about pain. And what they did was they've got the patient's uh, um, values at baseline. And then uh, it was a 0 to 10, so the average was about uh, a 6. And then they randomized them to the CoQ10 versus placebo and followed them while they were on a statin for the next uh, three months. And what's very interesting is everybody got better whether they were on the coenzyme Q10 or on the placebo. So it questions whether coenzyme Q10 works or whether there is potentially a placebo effect. They did also um, a actual pain questionnaire. Um, and again, when they looked at a lot of the different factors, didn't find that there was any change in it as well. And again, there's been a number of different trials out there that have looked at CoQ10, and it's mixed. A few of them have shown some suggestion that's beneficial, and a lot of them have shown that it's not. And I'll get back to my thoughts about CoQ10 as well, but I wanted to present the data. Now, interestingly, there's also some suggestion that vitamin D may play a role in this whole uh, myositis, myalgia type of situation. There's data out there that shows that vitamin D deficiency actually leads to muscle type of symptoms. Um, vitamin D receptors exist on the muscle, and they have both um, effects on the metabolism as well as the uptake and the processing uh, within the muscle. People who have vitamin D deficiency do show myalgias, do show weakness, and do show myopathy. And in fact, there's data out there that shows that in just the general population, mostly in kids or young adults, that if they supplement back vitamin D, that these symptoms improve and resolve. There's also data in the elderly population similar that weakness and uh, muscle aches and pains uh, in patients, and this is patients not on statins, um, if you supplement their vitamin D and get it back to a normal level, these symptoms improve. So there is some suggestion that vitamin D might be uh, involved in muscle problems to begin with. Now, one of the questions that has been proposed over the years could this be something that is important in the whole uh, statin situation? Do statins in patients who are vitamin D deficient increase the likelihood that they'll 
develop myalgias and arthralgias and some of those symptoms as well. There's been a number of studies done, and I just pick out two of the most recent ones that have been presented um, that have suggested that, in fact, if you supplement people's vitamin D, that it, their myalgias and arthralgias might improve. Um, Charlie Glick down in Cincinnati has done a couple of studies uh, where he has taken uh, statin intolerant patients where they've had low vitamin D levels and supplemented them with vitamin D for three weeks and then reinstituted the statin. Um, th this trial and the next one I'll show you were similar designs where um, he's done follow-up of the patients at three months. And what he has found is that uh, at the three months, he's been able to have uh, a large percentage in this study, 91% of the patients no longer have their myalgias. Um, he's been able to get the vitamin D levels from an average of 22 up to 43, and LDL lowering as well that has been pretty uh, significant. Um, he did a larger study that was, as I said, similar design. Again, um, uh, instituted the statin after three weeks of vitamin D supplement. Here he has a little bit longer follow-up, eight months. And again, he was able to find 87% were asymptomatic with uh, similar changes in the vitamin D and LDL levels. What was interesting in the second trial is that he published some additional information where he was able to find that there were a group of patients where he just put on the supplement, but their vitamin D levels didn't get back up to normal, who um, had uh, loss of symptoms, but there were also patients who uh, had normal vitamin D levels who continued to have symptoms. So again, it doesn't seem that it works in 100% of the patients. So there are other studies, again, that support the vitamin D. And one of the questions that always is, is what is the statins doing to the muscles? And I showed you before. Well, we're not 100% sure. Those are a couple theories about ways that maybe you can lessen the statin effects on um, the muscle itself. So one of the questions is, does the statin type make a difference. And there's been theories that maybe the um, hypo, uh, hydrophilic, which, you know, again, water-soluble versus the lipophilic might be uh, different. And in fact, the thought behind that is because the hydrophilics are less likely to be taken up into both the liver and the muscle cells. Well, um, Dr. Rocco didn't show specific data, and I'm not going to show it either, but there's really not much difference between the type of statin you are and the likelihood of having um, these side effects. So it may not really make a difference, but again, you know, that's conceptually something um, to think about. But what I'm gonna get to ultimately is the way you should approach the patient with statin intolerance. And I wanted to share some data because I'm gonna talk about um, alternate uh, ways of dosing the statins, some data that we've recently published out of the Cleveland Clinic that looked at um, intermediate, intermediate or intermittent dosing uh, patterns uh, with statins. So what we did is we looked at our whole preventive cardiology database, and we have data on patients who've been sent to us with regards to uh, their statin intolerance. And we subsequently looked at what happened to their uh, treatment as they um, saw us. And we've been able to divide the population into really three groups. Those patients that we couldn't get on a statin at all, um, no matter what we tried. Those patients that we were able to get on intermittent dosing, and intermittent dosing is at least once a week. And those patients who we were able to get on daily dosing. And you can see, for the most part, we were able to get a, a lot of these patients on um, daily dosing um, as well. But um, what you can see is that we got substantial LDL reduction with even intermittent dosing. And so again, that is something that um, talking about you know, the, the data that both Dr. Rocco and Dr. Uh, Venon shared with you, Menon shared with you, um, again, 
uh, we want to try to get them at least some LDL lowering. Now, my talk was about high-risk patients, and again, we looked at the different um, uh, risk groups here, and you can see that this is the patient, this is the percentage of patients who were able to get the goal, and even in the high-risk group, on the intermittent dosing, we were able to get 44% of the patients to their LDL goal. So I'm going to get back to it, but one of the things I want to bring across is that daily statin therapy may not be what we absolutely have to uh, ascertain. Getting the patient on the statin at all may be beneficial. And to further support that, um, we were able to look at uh, clinical outcomes. And there's been a number of trials out there, a number of studies that have looked at intermittent dosing. Um, we were the first ones to actually look at uh, some of our outcomes data uh, long term. And you can see that the patients who were either on daily dosing or intermittent dosing, their clinical outcomes were pretty similar um, and much better than those who were on uh, no dosing at all. Now, I brought up that group that couldn't get on statins. Um, and it's interesting, uh, Paul Phillips um, out in San Diego a number of years ago, when azetamide was going to come out, he was like uh, waiting. He couldn't, um, he just couldn't get by himself um, with regards to this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to get my patients' LDL cholesterols down. Well, he had this group of patients that you know, couldn't tolerate statins, put them on um, azetamide, they couldn't tolerate that either. He put them on niacin, they couldn't tolerate that. Any LDL-lowering therapy he put them on, they couldn't tolerate. Even, and I'll get to plant stanols, he put them on plant stanols and they couldn't tolerate it. So what he ended up doing was um, figuring out that there's a subgroup of patients that have actual problems with uh, fatty acid um, metabolism. And those patients cannot tolerate LDL lowering by aggressive LDL lowering by any mechanisms outside of just basic lifestyle changes. So the point of this is that even with the pragmatic uh, information I'm going to give you about how to page, uh, approach the patient, you may fail no matter what you try to do in a subset. And it's unclear what the percentage of this patient population is, but if you go back to like Glick's data or some of the data out there, it may be about 5 to 10% of the patients just can't tolerate any kind of lipid-lowering therapy. Okay. So approach to treating the patient with statin intolerance based on what I've given you. Well, first of all, the way I like to approach it is I think you should look at, you know, are there other reasons? And one of the biggest things to look at is, are they vitamin D deficient or have they ever had a history of vitamin D deficiency? You know, a lot of patients I'll get sent to me um, are vitamin D deficient. And I also see patients that get sent to me, they're no longer vitamin D deficient, but when I look back, they had been, they've been supplemented, but nobody's ever retried them on a statin. And often, if we can get their levels normal, um, by normal, I usually like to try to get them above 40, we can often get them on a statin medication. You can try coenzyme Q10. I showed you the data there uh, that doesn't really support it, but there's no harm in trying it. Usually, I'll try a dose of about 200 milligrams um, a day and then try, you know, again, the statin. Um, you can switch to another. We talked about hydrophilic versus lipophilic. Some patients can't tolerate a torvastatin and then can tolerate um, one of the other statins. It's always worth the try. Uh, intermittent statin dosing, I showed you the data. Again, I think it's worth trying. We often now, what we'll do with our intermittent um, dosing strategy is we'll start the patient at a very low dose. Um, two and a half of Crestor, five of Lipitor, once a week, and then we'll let them uh, tolerate it for a couple weeks, then we'll increase slowly to twice a week, then three times a week, and if they start not being able to tolerate it, we'll back down to a less often. 
Um, even with that, you know, sometimes we can uh, get patients up to uh, a daily dose on it. You can try combination therapies. So you can get somebody on intermittent dosing of a statin. It's worth getting them on a statin even once a week because of the pleiotropic effects. And then you can potentially add on other therapies. You can try non-pharmacological methods. Um, these are some of the ones that uh, we know can lower your uh, LDL cholesterol, um, plant stanols, plant, uh, phytosterols. There are supplements, uh, cholesterol being one that sometimes can work, ground flaxseed, um, dietary fiber, soy protein, selenium, you know, metamucil. All of those you can try incorporating. They can give you anywhere from a couple percentage up to maybe even 10% LDL lowering. You can add these on to some of the intermittent dosing as mechanisms. Um, and then you can try the non-statin uh, therapies that have already been talked about, niacin, uh, cholestyramine, um, azetamide. The problem with some of those non-statins uh, is that though the data does support some cardiovascular benefit, they are not at the extent that um, LDL lowering with statins have been shown. And with uh, the um, treatment of zetamide, we don't have any real clinical outcomes data that supports that it is going to have the clinical benefits that were somewhat limited. So with that, um, that's kind of the approach I think that we take with our statin intolerant patients, and I think the direction that you, know, you should think about with regards to uh, evaluating and treating the patient.